Hi, everyone, and welcome to the latest installation in the True Rating, True Rating webinar series. And uh, today for July's webinar, we have uh, an incredible topic, changes in consumer behavior in times of inflation. Uh, today, we actually have a record-breaking attendance for our webinar series, which just goes to show how important and top of mind this topic is for everyone right now. So thank you for joining. Thanks for being here. Uh, my name is Sean Connery. And in addition to hosting our webinars, I lead sales for our pharmacy and grocery industries in North America. And we do have a few uh, insights from those sectors today, but today's discussion is much farther reaching uh, than those industries. If you're a return visitor to our webinar series, you know that these we keep these presentations short and packed with value, um, and you won't have to listen to me for too long. I just have three quick points of housekeeping. Uh, the audience is muted today, but we're leaving time for Q&A, so please use that function um, in the webinar. Uh, we'll get to as many questions as we can and follow up with you directly on any that we might not be able to get to. Uh, point number two, yes, we are recording and we'll provide a copy to you within a few days. And finally, if you're on Twitter or LinkedIn, please use the hashtag consumer behavior and tag at true rating to join in on the conversation. I know for a fact there's some great quotable moments coming up. Um, so now on to our agenda. It's pretty straightforward. Um, we'll introduce our speakers. And then we're going to get right to the content um, and we'll leave time, as I said, for Q&A. So let's get to it. Uh, so first, we are so lucky to have with us Joe Skarupa, who's a consultant and editor at large for RAS News. Um, he's been named the top retail blogger in the country by Folio Magazine. Um, so thank you, Joe, so much for joining us today. Also, <laughs> also with us, we have Gareth Johns, the uh, chief data officer at True Rating. And um, for those of you who have joined us before, you know that Gareth started his career at Dunhumby in the UK working with Tesco helping launch Dunhumby USA as well, um, which is now 8451 at Kroger. Um, an incredible wealth of experience there. So Gareth, thank you so much for joining as well. And that's it, let's get to it. All right, let's kick off things. Um, you know, as a long time retail uh, veteran uh, in technology and uh, on the user side uh, with dot coms, uh, as well as a content producer, I know that times of high inflation are challenging for both consumers and retailers. However, um, there are tools and techniques that can reduce the negative impact uh, of high inflation. And that's really what uh, our discussion points are going to be talking about today. Certainly the ones I'm gonna be focusing on. Now, in addition to pulling back the uh, curtain on how inflation is specifically altering shopping behaviors, a very important point for retailers, I want to offer some executable strategies that retailers can deploy to reduce the negative impact of high priced goods and, and services and how you as a retailer can win over consumers and even gain an edge over targeted uh, competitors. Well, even because uh, these are challenging times, uh, I, I'm focusing on the positive steps that retailers can take to reduce customer churn as shoppers increasingly shop for bargains. Uh, how you can create short term wins, plan for long term gains simultaneously. Uh, build a value-based brand image and earn new shopper loyalty with targeted consumer groups. And uh, I know Gareth Johns has uh, some unique perspective that he brings to this discussion and uh, turn it over to him. Hi, Joe. Yeah, so um, I wanted to start off with a, a headline stat that I saw recently from McKinsey. Um, um, and that said that 90% that of consumers have noticed that prices are increasing. So. I think my first thought there was you've kind of got to wonder where are the other 10% shopping, right? So, I mean, prices are definitely going up. But I think what's interesting to me is um, about this finding is, is almost comparing it with what we saw over the last two years with COVID. Um, and what strikes me as different is that the impact of COVID was really different in different regions at different times around the globe and for different types of consumers. And some consumers actually found themselves with, with either more time or more discretionary income to invest. And some retailers on the back of that actually did really well during the last two years. But when you contrast that with the impact of inflation and the rising prices for retailers and, and the knock on impact to consumers, it feels like it's impacting everyone. And it also, you know, to a greater or lesser degree, and also it's impacting all types of retail. And so, and it also feels like it's going to be more consistent and, and potentially have a more of a prolonged period of, of impact. So um, 
while we might not make the massive drastic changes that we did during COVID for short periods of time, I think what we need to be preparing for is more subtle changes in consumer behavior that might actually last over a longer period. Yeah, and well, clearly, as you point out, um, Gareth, that the consumer behaviors have changed in the last two years. Throw out a couple of interesting uh, data points uh, on that. Uh, according to Google data that I've seen recently, digital holdouts, uh, certain demographics have finally started purchasing online for the first time during the last two years and uh, found that 75% of these first time users say they plan to continue shopping online. Also, there has been an 800% year over year growth in searches for the term in stock. And also searches for near me are now surpassing product searches. So these are interesting chains. However, from a strictly economic perspective, times of high inflation are primarily pricing challenges for retailers and consumers alike. Traditional methods can solve the, pro uh, the profit challenges, say institute a broad uh, across the board 10% increase to cover rising costs. However, um, that's like using a hammer. And uh, what you really need is a better tool for that. Um, a better way is to take a surgical approach, such as analyzing product lines and identifying key products that are important for shopper segments within those product lines, and maybe keep some prices to uh, the rise to a minimum while increasing uh, prices on less critical uh, products. Now, there are many factors that can be used to balance this once you identify your key products, such as which ones will actually grow market share, which ones will best align with the brand image, which ones will help save and achieve uh, sales and profit goals. Now, the first step to get this deep understanding of your key pro is to get this deep understanding of your key products and then to leverage this understanding to achieve profit goals. And Gareth, how are you seeing some of these consumer shifts? So looking at, I guess, mainly the last quarter, if you take Q2 really as, as kind of where I guess this all started to kick off, we're definitely starting to see that visits to stores um, are dropping across most of our retailers. And at the moment, that's kind of being offset by at least the fact that there are there is an increase in unit prices, right? So prices are going up, but also by the fact that when consumers don't do come, they are buying bigger baskets so that the, I guess, units per transaction is starting to go up. So it starts to feel like consumers may be shopping less often. Um, they may be being more thoughtful about how often they are traveling to store to shop. So, you know, maybe that's one of the impacts of the kind of increasing fuel prices. Um, but when they do visit, they are buying more items when they are in store. So if you think about how retailers generally measure all the KPIs that they have, I feels like they're going to be a bit all over the place. So, you know, footfall might be down and conversion might be down, but, um, you know, units per transaction might be up. So I think it's going to be important for retailers to really make sure that they've got all those metrics in place because different things are going to be changing at different times. And, and that's really going to be important to work out kind of what's going on for you as a retailer. So let's uh, let's jump to a different topic, uh, you know, certainly heavily related to what we're talking about, but get into a specific segment. Um, you know, for consumers, high prices for essential items, let's say grocery items, let's call them essential items, for example, are having a big impact. And uh, we are seeing trading down from high quality items to high value items. And we're seeing a sharper sensitivity to price increases we see a reduction in what might be considered luxury items. And I have other data on that that we'll, we'll share uh, in, in a little bit. Now, one of the strategies national retailers can take is to analyze their products and prices on a market by market approach. Now, I talked about a product line by product line approach. Think of it as a market by market approach. Inflation is not hitting every market in the same way. And regional differences can create opportunities to balance rising prices. For example, I live in California where avocados are considered an everyday essential product. I used to live on the East Coast and that was not the case. Uh, and I know it's probably not the case in the Midwest as well. So to boost the brand image on the West Coast, grocers could absorb much of the price increase 
um, to maintain customer share while allowing prices to increase in other regions to cover costs without having a negative impact on the brand image and uh, loyalty, of course, and share of wallet. Now, Gareth, what's your take on how grocers uh, and consumers are adjusting to high prices on essential items? Um, so I think kind of from a consumer point of view, there's, there's one thing that we've been looking at recently, which um, is asking consumers each month um, about different behaviors that they're doing. And across June, we saw a 10 percentage point swing in the number of consumers that said they have started to shop more around, shop around more when they, um, than they would have done previously before making a big purchase. And I guess for groceries specifically, another 10% shift in those that would say that they will shop for groceries um, using a list, which I think is more getting into that kind of thoughtful approach to grocery shopping. Um, to your points about the, uh, about the how people should price products, I think, as you say, grocers need to work out which of the products are most important to their price sensitive customers, or at least what products um, are the ones where customers are gonna know the price. Um, what we have to remember is that it's a small number of products that actually determine a brand's perception of value. Um, and in most cases, it's a perception. It's not a, it's not a decision that's based on some sort of comprehensive, you know, spreadsheet calculation of their full shopping basket. Um, so it's really about making sure that you get those, those few products that customers are using to judge, to, to judge, uh, value, right. Um, and not to go too deep into price optimization, but for everyday low pricing to work and to maintain consumers trust in pricing, I think it needs to be done in a way that kind of maintains internal consistency. And what I mean by that is that the same product in a different color or flavor um, has to have the same price. Also, the more I buy of a product, then the better the deal is I have to get. And I think when those internal consistencies are missing, customers start to lose trust in everyday low pricing and they start to hold out because they're getting worried about the fact that, well, I can't trust this price and maybe there's a better deal around the, the corner. So I think, you know, that internal consistency as well as picking the products that you need to you need to be competitive of them is really important. Um, I think one other point on the, I guess, pricing of specific products is that it's not just limited to grocery. Um, we talk a lot about, you know, pricing of, of uh, grocery items, but we've seen that even a small dollar difference in the price of well-known and high ticket products can influence value perception. So, you know, Historically in grocery, you might say that you have to be competitive on milk because everybody pretty much knows the, the price of a, you know, a carton of milk. What we actually saw that was for one of our clients, which is a high-end Australian sports fashion retailer, that value perception of the brand as a whole could be impacted by whether when they did a, 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 a drop of one of kind of the new Nike Air Maxes, whether those were selling at $250 or $245, which in percentage terms seems like a really small deal. Um, can have a big impact on the value perception of the brand. So in that case, it's maybe less knowing about the products that appeal to price sensitive customers, because you're talking about a fairly high end ticket price, but actually knowing the products that consumers research and the ones where they know the competitive price. Uh, I think in terms of other impacts on grocery, one is that, as I said, they're being more thoughtful. So, you know, they are shopping more with a list than we've seen ever before. And I think that's a, that's a point of trying to reduce wasted spend. Uh, but we're also seeing customers be less tempted by promotions that increase rather than reduce their total spend. So those kind of buy one, get one half price type things. And I think we'll see a move to private label and we're starting to see that with some of our grocery retailers, um, as well as splitting the weekly shop across multiple grocers. So, you know, I imagine that that kind of part of the shop that's missing is, is going to the discounters. Um, so, you know, those are all factors I think that are coming into play as, in, as inflation starts to bite. And for grocers that have, have up until now focused on some of those other values of quality, convenience, extended range, um, organic, ethical sourcing, all those factors are important, but they're going to come under more pressure from this kind of greater focus on price and, and value. Um, so we're going to really see how important those factors are to consumers. Uh, the only thing I'd say in all of that, and kind of harking back to my point about COVID at the beginning, is during COVID, um, our, our behaviour changed also because our kind of situation changed. But I think think about this: even though inflation is going up, you know, we're all still having to work just as hard. We're all just as time poor as we ever were. 
So convenience is still going to be really important in the grocery sector. Um, and I think we're all still going to want to treat ourselves occasionally. So, you know, that's going to be an important thing to take into account. But actually, this is an opportunity, I think, for grocery as well, because I think we'll start to see more shopping missions that maybe we hadn't seen before. So as people start to be less able to afford to eat out in restaurants or to get takeout, and we saw it see more dining in, then that's almost like an increase in a certain type of shopping mission that um, is going to be important for grocery. But you know, again, it's not just a grocery phenomenon. I think a lot of businesses can start to look at, I mean, especially the outlets and the discounters, can start to look at what where can I gain market share and where can I gain customers um, because of the, the cost inflation that's coming in and the fact that consumers are changing their behaviors. Okay, let's shift to uh, other sectors of retail, uh, such as uh, discretionary retail, another important part uh, of the retail mix. You know, in discretionary retail, say fashion and apparel, for example, the impact is different than it is uh, in grocery and for essential products. In fact, according to a recent in-store traffic data uh, report that I saw up to uh, May uh, 2022, just recently, luxury retail foot traffic um, is down 40% compared to pre-COVID levels. Now, clearly shoppers are more discerning. They're researching more. They're doing uh, uh, more uh, shopping based on price sensitivity and they're seeking bargains in the non-essential area. So one good strategy for retailers uh, is to recognize the power of their promotions and discounts. Uh, running promotions and discounts should not just feature uh, special items, uh, unique items, seasonal items, but it should also feature basic core items that help create a brand image that now shifts a little bit more toward value, even in uh, the luxury sector. Uh, also experimenting with promotions, find out which items uh, can add to a perception of value by dropping less than the 25 to 40% discount that uh, is the blockbuster that brings people in. But just dropping it 15 to 20% is a key to uh, promotions that can strategically build that brand image for value while not taking the big hit to uh, the profit line. And uh, this is not just for driving sales, this is for staying relevant uh, with uh, consumers as consumers are shopping around more, are searching more, they're finding that trigger that's gonna uh, bring them in and, uh, and, and entice them at a time when they really need to stretch their dollars, even, uh, even in the uh, discretionary field. So, Gareth, switching over to discretionary spending, uh, what uh, what trends are you seeing? Yeah, so I think as, as you mentioned in the slide and as we've seen from the data so far, we're definitely seeing that customers are visiting less often. Um, now, with luxuries down 40%, I don't think we're seeing that sort of level yet within, I guess, the other areas of discretionary retail, um, but it's definitely a drop from previous quarters. Um, and I think customers seem to be um, almost delaying those discretionary spends. So they're foregoing some kind of immediate satisfaction that comes from exclusivity from, you know, the new drops of products and, and potentially they're waiting for a better deal or for a promotion at the end of the season. And obviously the danger therefore for, for retailers is that they're going to be left with a lot more excess inventory, which are then going to have to sell off at, at a deeper discount at the end of the, uh, the end of the season. Um, I think to your point about strategic promotions, this to me is where personalization can really be key. So, you know, if you've, if you've got the ability to understand your customers through some sort of loyalty scheme, if you have a means to communicate with them directly rather than kind of in a broad broadcast way, um, and you can personalize the offers, that's really gonna be key to, I guess, shifting the stock at the minimum amount of discount that you can. So knowing what customers are driven by promotion and buy on deal, um, knowing, how much discount you have to give, and it's probably not very much to start getting them in and get them in on things like early bird sales or you know member only discounts to try and get them before you have to drop to a to such a deep discount. I think is going to be key. Um, so yeah, I think looking to not only as you say like pick the products to put on promotion to improve your value perception, but also picking the customers to offer the promotions to at the right time to um, to get stock moving as quickly as possible. 
Yeah, absolutely. Just just as I had said before, knowing a deep understanding of your products is key to determine how your surgical strategy is going to arrange your pricing. Uh, having a deep understanding of your customers is key to, uh, to know how you can have a surgical approach to promotions through personalization. Yeah, absolutely. So Gareth, I, I'm going to just do a, a little bit of an overview uh, of some of the key points that, uh, that we've made. And one important takeaway I'd like to start with and emphasize is that uh, over the last two years of the pandemic and during uh, this year's period of high inflation, I believe that scrambled the egg for consumer behaviors, for shopper behaviors. And consumers are clearly shopping around and trying new things like never before. And so one thing I would recommend is to your point, uh, that personalization point is to focus on loyalty. Make sure that your churn is not high. Make sure you're keeping uh, your, your loyal customers uh, happy at, with a perception of value and, and competitive pricing. And, uh, and once you do that, um, you can focus on things of value to uh, shoppers um, that uh, are not necessarily price oriented. You can focus, as you mentioned, uh, Gareth, uh, during the grocery uh, comments, if convenience is a big important to your brand image, focus on convenience. If it is service, that's a big uh, important part of your brand image. Don't let uh, service drop, uh, even in times uh, when uh, wages are rising and there may be difficulty in, in hiring. If those are key to your brand image, those have to be emphasized during this period so that you're not just dropping the ball and having churn take place during your core base of consumers. At the same time, uh, I recommend seeking long-term advantages through short-term initiatives. In other words, don't forget your long-term gains as you're doing short-term adaptations to uh, just to high inflationary times. Use those targeted promotions to not only win price sensitive shoppers and uh, keep your churn uh, uh, from going too high in your loyal base, but to target new shoppers, to target specific shopper groups that, uh, that is part of your long-term plan. For example, if seasonal center aisle items for a grocer is a long-term goal, then now is a good time to do this launch, to actually capture that large group of shoppers uh, that you may not have been getting before, and then you have a chance of keeping them because they are searching around more. They're trying new things, and this is a great time for you to add to your customer base. Don't pull back on the long-term gains, even as you roll out your short-term responses to high inflation. I also suggest focusing on value attributes other than price, such as eco-friendly wellness and socially responsible. Identifying with the shopper's own values is a good way to earn respect, do something for the greater good, and build loyalty that adds value that goes far beyond price, which is a long lasting uh, customer attribute um, uh, and a basis for loyalty. And then finally focus on in-house brands. Gareth mentioned in-house brands uh, and they typically are exclusive to a retailer and they typically offer better profit margins or at least I would say more controllable profit margins than national brands. Now this strategy can work across the board for grocery and it can work for apparel and it can work for home improvement and it can work for a lot of retail segments. So retailers without a strong in-house brand cap capability, well, I suggest this is a good time for you to give that a boost. Gareth? Yeah, I think as a final point, I'd like to link, I think your point on loyalty and the one on, on the value attributes, because I think they are, they're closely linked. And I think sometimes when people see the word loyalty, they, they too often confuse that with just a loyalty program. And, and my, really my point is that loyalty is not gonna come solely from having a loyalty program. And you're not going to be able to maintain customer spend through dangling some carrot of the benefits of a loyalty program through higher spend or more visits because you know i just don't think you can buy loyalty especially in this kind of times um you know i think actually um when we've talked to customers and asked them questions about you know what why are they loyal to a brand um on this subject the, the things that they say more is they are loyal to retailers that share their values so 70 percent of customers said that rather than they are loyal to a brand because they are a member of the loyalty program um, or because they thought they were getting great benefits, which was just over 
So I think you actually have to think about loyalty different. Loyalty is not about your consumers being loyal to you. It's the other way around. It's about you being loyal to your customers. Um, and I guess in tough times when retailers are, that's when you have the ability to most show your loyalty to your customers and to do the things that you mentioned, Joe, to, to help customers as much as possible in the difficult times. And hopefully that investment pays off in them staying with you, you know, for the, for the further, for the future, not just for this immediate challenging period. Awesome. Wow. Thanks, Joe and Gareth. That was incredible. And uh, Gareth, you've got me thinking like um, that point you just made about uh, the research um, you've done that 70% when we were asking about loyalty, 70% of people said it was about sharing values with the organization. 77, yeah. 77% on sharing values and just over 50 on um, loyalty benefits. So I think uh, the values are, are definitely an important point as, as uh, Joe made out on the, you know, that point three there. I feel like that's a huge shift. Um, I don't have a data point from 10 years ago, but when I, when I think of, you know, what I was seeing from consumer behavior reports and recommendations for, you know, how to build loyalty, that was just sort of a, a basic idea. And now it's coming through with consumers being loud and vocal about it. That's, that's fascinating. Um, well, everyone, we're we're pretty close to on time here. We're we're just about to wrap up. We do have a couple of questions that have come through, um, so we'll probably go for another two minutes or so. Um, and so, please take a moment now to to share any additional questions you might have through the chat. Um, quickly, I'll share a couple of thoughts about curating in case you haven't encountered us before. Um, we are a consumer first brand, and what we do is we put. Um, a question at the point of sale, whether that be in store or online. And we wrap all that information around uh, what people are buying. So we, we bring that uh, consumer opinion and sentiment together with what people are buying. And that's how we get um, such incredible insights in terms of what really does drive increased spend and loyalty from customers. Um, every time we ask a question of a consumer, we donate to a children's charity, which is just, a, of course, a good thing to do, but also brings uh, brings people back and keeps them uh, wanting to rate with true rating when they see that question, um, which is how we build those 80% plus response rates in store. Um, we also build social proof by publishing those ratings online so that all the other consumers out there can see um, those and learn about those great experiences that the rest of the customers are having in store. Um, so quickly now, a um, couple of questions that have come through. Um, the first one I have here is, um, will consumer behavior shifts that we are seeing today be long lasting or disappear quickly when inflation comes back down again? I'll take a quick crack at that and turn it over to Gareth. I, I think that it's on a, uh, a segment by segment, generation by generation basis. I think that um, as uh, Google pointed out, uh, there were holdouts. Uh, that did not actually join the online uh, purchasing uh, revolution, let's say. Uh, that's been going on for a long time, and yet these holdouts uh, were, were, not, uh, were not joining. So the, uh, the much larger part of the population uh, than ever before uh, will, uh, will be participating in online retail. And I think that's, that's going to be a permanent shift. As Google pointed out, 75% of these will plan to continue uh, online shopping. So I think that uh, that that it will be long lasting, but I I think that the uh, you know, kind of a shorter term uh, with long term implications is that it reinforces the importance of omni channel uh, retail for for retailers. So we we talked about foot traffic being up in some places, down in other places, online traffic being up across the board. All of these for a retailer will have to work together. And certainly, consumers are committed to omnichannel. Yeah, great insight. Get yeah, I think for me, I, well, I think I think it will be a time for consumers to to find and experience new brands um, and new retailers. And so, I guess that's either an opportunity if you can capture new people from elsewhere, or it's a risk if you are going to lose some of your customers or some of your spend to other retailers. I don't think you can rely on the fact that. It's going to be a you know ride it out and everything will be better in a year. I think you have to assume that 
if people start to change their behaviors some of them won't come back so you know you need to be looking at this as a as an opportunity to do something different and to keep fighting for your customers uh, rather than something to kind of i guess ride out so yeah i think it will be it will see some permanent shifts in behavior okay great thanks for that um we'll do one more question um what one tip stands out as the best way for retailers to successfully navigate through times of high inflation i'll just jump in with a very quick one i use that word surgical and uh by surgical i'm referring to uh, uh taking a good look at all of the key products that you have uh, and identifying which ones are most closely aligned with your brand image and with very specific shopper groups. And uh, Gareth made a great point on adding on to that, saying surgical also means uh, personalization, being personalized with whatever step you're taking uh, as not being you know, the hammer blow, uh, you know, but being something that is much sharper and targeted and therefore uh, it will become much more effective. I think my final tip would be the point about being loyal to your customers rather than the other way around and, and staying, sticking true to your values. So I think, you know, as costs start to hit, there's gonna be real pressure to look at ways to save costs, to cut costs. Um, <clears throat> and technology can do that to a degree. So, you know, you can move to self-checkout, you, uh, you could start to, to, to shift to maybe not being as a convenient place to shop. But if those are your values that you're going for, and if you're trying to push a message that you are convenient um, or that you do offer great service, I think you have to find a way to stick to those because consumers will notice if, you know, your brand, your brand values and, and kind of your, the actual experience they have in store starts to really not connect anymore. So yeah, so you've kind of got to pick what you're, pick your battles and pick what you want to be famous for and really stick to trying to, to deliver on those things. Um, and not let cost cutting impact those too much. I love that. What a great way to end. Let's flip loyalty around and be loyal to our customers. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, Gareth. And thanks to everyone who joined us today. Um, what a great conversation. Um, we'll, like I said, we'll be providing the recording to you shortly. And we'll see you next month. <laughs>